Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Northminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Reverend Jenny Carlson, and I welcome you here today. We have some congregational announcements. The first being, we do have a congregational meeting immediately following worship today um, for the purpose of selecting our nominating committee. The nominating committee is who does the work of trying to find new elders and deacons for the church. Um, and that is something that we are very much in need of. So if you have ever felt a calling in your heart to do that kind of service, uh, definitely talk with those committee members once we get them nominated. Um, for those of you on Zoom, it will take us a couple of minutes to transform um, and bring the Zoom here into the sanctuary. So give us uh, about five minutes to do that and then we'll get started. I uh, also wanted to remind everybody that amazingly, Daylight Savings starts next Sunday. <laughs> so make sure that you are paying attention to the clock so that you are here on time um, next week. Uh, we also have coming up this week, we have Bible study tomorrow morning and we have mosaic on Wednesday night and for March I decided to just go for broke and we're going to discuss religion and politics because why not <laughs> um, actually what we're going to talk about is how do we discuss those things and what are the barriers that we put up to prevent us from talking about those things and especially in an election year understanding how the two come together is actually really important for us so we're just going to regardless of what your political affiliation is we're just going to kind of talk about it more generally of how do we have those hard conversations. Uh, and then coming up for us, we have a very unique opportunity on the 16th of March. Uh, the Thriving Congregations Initiative Group went through a special training with Yarrow Durban um, on polarities. And we have invited Yarrow to come um, and we are using some of our thriving um, money from the Lilly Foundation to pay for Yarrow to come do that training here on the 16th. And the reason why we felt that that was important is that uh, in this workshop, Yarrow talks specifically around these conceptual ideas of things being on either or. And her workshop kind of helps us unpack how do we bring those into a both and. That oftentimes we have a polarity and we think we'd have to be on one end or the other, when in fact both ends actually need the other for balance. So an example would be tradition and change, which is something that we know um, is in constant tension within the church. How do we hold on to our traditions, but how do we also change with the needs of our community? And that there isn't an either or in that, it's actually a both and, we need to do both. And so the workshop um, talks about that, but also gives a very specific activity for how to, when you're feeling sort of stuck, in between those polarities or feeling like a lot of tension between them. How do you sort of come back together and figure out what is the good in both? And so um, she's gonna come and lead us through that workshop. So if you are interested, it is nine to noon on Saturday, March 16th. If you're interested in coming, um, please RSVP to me um, or Martine. 
and we will kind of have that set up for um, so we have an idea of how many folks are coming um, but we invite actually all of the congregation I've sort of I've required that <laughs> I required the deacons and the uh, session to attend but we definitely would like to have everybody um, come and be a part of that so that will be on the 16th um, are there any other announcements we have Liz. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think most of you know about the Deacon's Drives, but I'm just here to give you a quick update. Um, I'm here to thank those of you who have already contributed to our collection drive of hygiene products for the Ballard Food Bank. And we're off to a good start. And we will be continuing to collect those products, um, which are listed in the insert in your bulletin. Um, through uh, through the month of March. So please consider donating one or more of those items, or if you prefer, you can also write a check to benefit the Ballard Food Bank for this Lent drive. And there, the collection bin will be out in the narthex, and you can also give me anything that you have that you want to give me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'd also like to remind you about the upcoming sock drive that we're going to be collecting on Palm Sunday, where we're collecting um, cotton athletic socks for men. And we'll be doing that during the worship service. And that's to uh, give to Operation Night Work, Night Watch, I'm sorry, which works with, um, I'm not sure what the correct term is now. Unhoused. Unhoused people, mostly men. So thank you for your kindness and your consideration, and please give what you can. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, the bin is already starting to collect things in the Narthex, so thank you for those of you who've donated already. Any other announcements? Okay. All right, then let us go ahead and take in a deep breath and settle our hearts and our minds remembering that we have been loved since before the foundation of the world. So let us worship God. Please stand as you're able for the call to worship. In Christ, the God of heaven has made his home on earth. Christ dwells among us and is one with us. Highest of all creation, he lives among the least. He journeys with the rejected and welcomes the weary. Come now, all who thirst, and drink the water of life. Come now, all who hunger, and be filled with good things. Come now, all who seek, and be warmed by the fire of love.
You may be seated. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. God of compassion, you are slow to anger and full of mercy, welcoming sinners who return to you with penitent hearts. Receive in your loving embrace all who come home to you. Seat them at your bountiful table of grace that with all your children, they may feast with delight on all that satisfies the hungry heart. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In this place, we find God's word, God's way, God's love, and God's forgiveness. What more do we need to sustain us as we continue as pilgrims along the way? In every wilderness, on every road, in every moment, in every life, in every journey, in every heart, we receive the daily bread we need, God's hope, God's mercy, and God's joy. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. Well, friends, we come to our time of the passing of the peace. Um, and so the way that we typically do that is I'll welcome those who are on the telephone with us and then extend blessings here within the sanctuary. And then I'll call you all back together with um, uh, the words of peace from those who are joining us via Zoom. Um, and this Lenten season, uh, we have been experimenting a little bit with uh, something we're calling Children's Church, which we are inviting kids to do after the passing of the feast. It's completely optional. You don't have to do it. If you don't want to, parents, you're welcome totally always welcome to stay here in the sanctuary. Um, but if you feel like doing it, you can follow Dustin um, after the passing of the peace, and he's gonna actually say a quick blessing before you all go. So uh, we extend warm blessings of peace to Jen Olson, who's joining us by telephone today. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Please turn to one another and exchange a sign of peace.
Peace to everyone from Julia, who also wants us to remember to wish Georgia a very happy birthday today. Uh, peace and love to all dear friends from Carol. Peace and blessings from Katie Tynan. Peace and love from Winona. God's peace and blessings to everyone from Charlotte. Peace and love to all from Lori. The little ones want to join me down here. We'll have a quick prayer, and then anyone who wants to come with me can. And if you don't, you can go back to your seats. Shall we pray? Holy One, we give you thanks for the time to come together in worship with everyone. We give you thanks for these, our youngest members of our community. And we give you thanks that you came to us as a child. Do you understand what it is to be a child and how to learn like a child? And we thank you for the opportunity to learn those stories and learn as you did, as we all do. In your name we pray, amen. Lord God, let the words of your servant's mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, through Christ, amen. Today's first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20th, verses one through 17. Then, God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox, ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord.
Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John in chapter 2, uh, starting with verse 13 through uh, 17. <laughs> like, I'm going to mark my mark. Um, so I'm going to be reading for the NRSV UE, so it may differ slightly from your pew Bibles, but um, it should be close. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our sermon series throughout this Lent is looking at the different covenants that God has made with us and we have made with God in return. And our first scripture uh, took us through the Ten Commandments, uh, which was sort of the original kind of outline of what we call the law. And in 2005, uh, the Supreme Court issued two rulings in one day on two cases that centered on the Ten Commandments. In the first case, Van Orden versus Perry, the court ruled that a giant granite um, piece of art that stood outside of a courthouse in Texas was allowed, primarily because it was part of a garden that contained 17 other monuments and that the monument itself for the Ten Commandments had stood for about 40 years without any objection by anyone. And the court felt that given the circumstance of this statue dedicated to the Ten Commandments outside the courthouse, that it centered in the category of free speech and therefore could remain in place. The second ruling they made that day was McCreary County versus the ACLU, which was a case revolving that county's recent rule requiring that the Ten Commandments be on visible display inside of the county courtroom. This, the court ruled, was a violation of the Establishment Clause, which is the section of the First Amendment that requires or prohibits the government from establishing any one particular religion that is a national religion. And so therefore the Ten Commandments could not be displayed in the courtroom. And the commandments and it's kind of these two rulings were seen as this very diametrically opposed thing like the supreme court was doing too radically it did for a lot of people it didn't make sense and the ten, because the ten commandments is referred to as the law um, both in scripture as well as for us theologically and that was what people were advocating that this is god's law and it's, it's supreme over any other law and that all laws of this nation are based upon it and this passage that we read from Exodus sort of outlaws all of these rules that are dictated about how the people are to live as God's people. They're rules for how God wants humans to live and interact with God, as well as how we are to live and interact with each other. So with God, we are to have one God that we follow we're not to turn other things or people into gods. We're not to talk about God in a way that diminishes or stains God and who God is. And we are to take one day out of every seven to fully rest. And it's interesting that the scripture says we are to take that seventh day and keep it holy, which implies we are supposed to use this time to draw closer to God. But the commandment doesn't require us to worship per se. What God wants for us to do is to pause, to be still, to listen, and to rest. To me, this reflects a God that wants 
to know us and knows that we will hear and understand the voice of God best when we're quiet, unencumbered by the pressures of our daily world. So what God has directed us to do is to set this one day aside solely for the purpose of enriching our relationship with God and give God a chance to love us in a moment when we're most able to receive it. That's really profoundly forward thinking of God when you think about that, that God would know our lives would become so busy, so full, that we would need to have a rule that reminds us, stop, be still, and rest. This day is meant to be slower, calmer, to give us the space to be still. And when I'm sometimes asked, what is the point of going to church in this current age, especially in a city that the New York, uh, Seattle Times recently declared as being, again, the most unchurched city in the country. That's my answer. We come into this space because it is set aside as holy and sacred. We come into this space with the intention to connect to the divine. We can absolutely encounter the divine out in the world, wherever we are, in all these different times and places, but that is when God is pushing through the noise to reach us. But when we come here, we're making the choice to connect with the divine and opening ourselves up to whatever may be revealed to us. Being in a sacred space does that in a way that no other spaces do. That's beautiful. Now the second section of the law focuses on how we are meant to be in relationship with each other. We're meant to treat our elders with care and respect. We're not to murder, lie about, or steal from each other. We are to respect our partners in life and honor the commitment we've made to them. And we're not to waste our energy comparing ourselves to others or craving what they have. And actually nearly all religions and spiritual practices have similar guidelines. Because the fact is we don't like it when people do those things to us. Now Jesus comes along with a new covenant but really what Jesus creates is just a shorthand for the old covenant. <laughs> Jesus proclaims, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, all your soul and all your strength and love your neighbors as yourself. There are no greater commandments than these. So God's law is actually really quite simple. Love God, love each other. And they'll sound like really good laws. And frankly, most countries do have political laws that follow these same ideas. What we encounter in John's passage from today, though, is what happens when God's law becomes too enmeshed with political power. The story that we read in John is well known for us at this time of year. Jesus comes into the temple in Jerusalem is so offended by all the things that is happening that he yells, he flips tables, and he screams for everyone to get out because they are desecrating his father's house. And in the synoptic gospels, meaning Mark, Matthew, and Luke, this story takes place during the events of Holy Week and is presented as sort of the big reason for why Jesus is later arrested and killed. John, however, sets the story differently. In John, this story comes in chapter two, at the beginning, at the start of the story. And we're gonna talk about the significance of that in a moment. But the Jesus that we encounter in John is arguably the most human and perhaps the most relatable of all of the versions of Jesus we see in the Gospels. The Jesus that we find in John is sassy and emotional, argumentative, compassionate, and very social. There's not a party this man misses. 
Jesus connects to people in a deeply personal way in this gospel. And so this story has Jesus displaying even more feeling in this moment. He fashions a whip to drive out all who are in this temple causing offense, animals and people. This isn't just him standing and screaming, he's physically using a tool that is actually also a weapon to force them out. He is in this moment the angriest we will ever see him in all of scripture. So John wants us to feel that anger too. This story is meant to shake us up and make us pay attention. So let's pay attention. What is happening at the temple right now to make this Jesus, this version of Jesus feel so strongly? What is going on? Well, first we do know it's Passover. John sets the stage for that. It means that there's a lot of people coming into Jerusalem. They're giving their offerings, they're attending the worship services, and this is a huge festival day for them. The offerings that they make are outlined in great detail in Leviticus, so if you feel like reading up on them, go ahead. It's a great snore if you need to sleep. Um, they are also under Roman occupation at this time. So there are additional taxes being collected on top of what is being offered at the temple. The Romans are there to take their cut. These animals that are being sold are sold to the people who didn't bring either enough or the right kind of an offering. So the temple is also functioning kind of like a bank. Loans and collections of debts are also happening at this time. And so there is a lot of economic hardship and disparity on display in this moment. We also know from the other stories that are happening in the life of Jesus that the law, these 10 commandments, have been around long enough that they are interpreted and expanded into other parts of their social and political life. Jesus has been heavily criticized for the things that he does on the Sabbath for consorting with those who either follow other gods or are connected to the other tribes of Israel who have become separated from each other over the various disagreements about how the law should be interpreted and executed over time. So they're all from the same people, they're all Jewish, but they're all spread out. And so the Levites and the Samaritans, all of these are, they're all from the 12 tribes, but they're treated so differently. And Jesus is criticized for the fact that he talks to them all the same. He doesn't shun them. And so basically Jesus has come to the temple at a time when religious life and political life have become deeply entangled as a means of exerting power over the people. Who's in, who's out, what's allowed, what's not. And the poor and the marginalized are suffering the most under those who are using God's law and connected power to Rome to keep themselves in status and wealth. And ironically, in doing that, they are breaking several commandments, such as stealing, coveting, honoring of the elderly, and the smearing of God's name, which is what happens when you use God to justify your own abuse of power. So we understand why Jesus was so mad. This sacred space is meant to be where the people come to connect to their God. And it has become a space where people go because they have to, because they have to make the payments that are required by law. And imagine walking into this space and having the IRS tables over on one side and Wells Fargo agents lining the other side while there's a whole group of televangelists up here shaming you while also verbally abusing you. That's what Jesus walked into. And he drove them out because all of that is not who he knew God to be, because he is God's son. And these power brokers 
are in the temple saying, this is who God is and what God wants of you. And Jesus stands there and shouts, no. God created a covenant of law with us and in giving us the Ten Commandments as our framework for our relationship with God and one another, we promise back to follow them. And our lives and our relationships are better when we do that as they were intended. But the brokenness of humanity is that we have over and over again manipulated this covenant to serve ourselves and our own power. Telling those that we subjugate, this is how God wants it. This is what God expects. And Jesus stands opposed to this abuse of God's law. So much so that that's why John puts this story right up front. So that everyone who reads this gospel reads of Jesus right from the very beginning as a liberator and a fighter for justice. And if you want proof of God's dedication to this kind of justice, we only have to look to the number of times that God has inspired people to stand opposed to that way of reading the law. Jesus clears the temple aggressively. Martin Luther nails 99 questions to the door. Abolitionists fight a war and create an underground railroad. Martin Luther King marches and has freedom rights. There are many who have used God or the Ten Commandments or scripture to justify their abuse of power, but there have also been just as many people who walk up and flip tables and say no. Because just as surely as a government aligned with religion leads us to dark places, the practices of our faith is where God calls us back into the light. The separation of church and state has long been one of the strongest ethics of our national government. So strong that when we see our sisters and brothers preach and clamor for a Christian nationalist state, it seems almost so crazy as to be unreal. Yet it is both real and very prescient. It is incumbent upon us to remind our brethren of the day that Jesus cleaned the temple. He didn't drive out queer people or those with disease or folks who were off cussing in the corner, though I imagine when the whips broke out, there was a fair amount of swearing. Jesus drove out those who were manipulating and stealing from the poor those who were shaming people because they hadn't brought offerings that were deemed good enough. He drove out the political operators who were turning a blind eye while the people were hurting and they took their cut off the top. He drove out everyone who was hurting others for their own gain and those who were using God as their excuse to ignore the very real needs of the people in front of them and instead acted to increase their suffering. So on that day in 2005, the Supreme Court took a lot of heat for issuing these two rulings that seemed to contradict each other. But I actually think they got it right. The Ten Commandments contain within them a great deal of wisdom. And they do reflect the covenant that we made with God to live in a way that honors our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. As people of faith, I don't think that we need to hide from that. So creating a piece of art that puts them out there as a reminder to ourselves that we are in this covenant, I think that's great. I'd love to see other faiths doing the same, if only so that we could teach each other that there's not a lot of difference between us. It is also true that our covenant with God is between us and God, not between us and the government. The laws of our nation are malleable, they're reformable, They're meant to reflect the needs and the values of our people at a particular moment in time. 
They should change as we evolve and grow as a culture because we are not in covenant with the United States. Which is perhaps the most important reason why Christian nationalism is wrong. It breaks the first commandment and it makes this country your God. And by God's own word, God is a jealous God. Thou shall have no other gods before him. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we are thankful for the promise that you made to us so long ago. A promise where you reached out and said, these are the things that are gonna make all of our lives easier. These are the ways we are to behave so that we can honor and be in relationship with God and so that we can honor and be in relationship with each other. It wasn't an exhaustive list, it was relatively simple. And it highlighted in particular the most cruel things that we can do to each other. And that in this covenant, you said, be wary of these things. Don't do them, because it's only going to lead to heartbreak. And across time, we have taken those very simple 10 guidelines, and we have manipulated them. We have changed what they meant to imply that we are called in some twisted way to hurt and to subjugate, to enslave, and to brutalize. We have done this physically, we have done it emotionally, and we have done it across the globe. And that is not the commandment that you gave. And so Lord, as we take this moment in Lent to reflect on this promise that we have made, the promise that you gave to us and explain in very simple terms how we are to return it, we confess all the ways in which we have not lived up to our end of that promise. And so as we reflect on our current age, on our daily lives, help us to hold these rules not as emblems of oppression, but rather as a personal agreement between us and you. That this is a private, solemn promise that was made for the benefit of our relationship with you and was made for the benefit of your church. And so help us to both honor that commitment and to be open-minded and forthright in all of the ways in which we have manipulated it for harm and to seek resolution, reconciliation, and forgiveness in all the ways in which we have harmed others by using it in a way it was never intended. All of these things we pray in your holy name. Amen.
We come now to the time of the service where we respond to the word with our offerings. There are baskets in the back and there are links online for that. Um, please bow your heads with me as we uh, bless this, this uh, time of tithing and giving back and responding to, um, to our God. Creator, savior, sustainer, we live in a world of wealth, but we fear scarcity. Your creation is the picture of abundance, yet we waste it and we allow for greed to take advantage and hoard it from others. Help us to live and to give in a way that reflects your boundless and bottomless love, your infinite power, and your desire for all to have their health, their fill, and their wholeness. Use these gifts to bring more shalom here in our city and in our world. Amen. So we come to the time of prayers of the people, and so um, I will pray for us collectively for a bit, and then I will open it up if any of you have prayers that you want to offer up here within the sanctuary. And those who are on Zoom, go ahead and um, type your prayers into the chat, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, as we gather together on this time, we are mindful of all of the things that come with spring, the changes that mark the changing of the weather, the changing of the time of day, and the things that can sort of set us a little bit disoriented as we sort of awaken from the depths of winter. And so we pray for those who have struggled during these times of change, whether they are struggling with allergies or mental concerns, needing to have more exposure to light and craving that, while also having to deal with the adjustment of internal body clocks as the times change. To those who are looking forward to the warmer weather because their circumstances are living outside and you never know around here when we may wake up to snow flurries even in the midst of spring. So Lord, we pray for all of those who are in the midst of change. We hold them close and we pray that they can find the strength and the encouragement and the wisdom to navigate these changes faithfully and with courage. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we hold especially close today our dear friend Fred, who has been in the hospital, in and out of the hospital, and is currently at a rehab facility and is struggling to understand what has been going on, to understand exactly where he is and what's happening. So we just pray for healing for him. We pray that the way forward is made clear for his healthcare providers and for his family as they navigate these changes. And we pray that there can be a way for him to come back to us, to be here where we can see him and connect with him but also pray for ways in which as he heals and recovers that he can connect with us. And so we just offer all of those places where people either feel inspired to visit him or write him or call him, but also just pray that his body can recover so that he can come back to us. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we also recognize that we are in a time of great uncertainty, that if we pay too close attention to the news, we can feel despondent, we can feel afraid, and we can be massively unsure of what the future holds, whether that is politically or in terms of climate or population growth, to just the everyday concerns of just what happens in our city and where is our money going and how are our schools functioning? All of these things can be heavy burdens upon us. And so I just pray that we can find the space to step away from the noise, to be thoughtful, contemplative, to have conversation that is both meaningful and heartfelt, where we can remember that the future rests in you, that we don't need to be afraid, but that doesn't mean that there isn't work to do, that we remember that the definition of peace is not to be in a place that is completely free of noise and hard work, but to be in the place where we are managing the noise and the hard work, but being calm in our hearts. And then we do that because we are connected to you. So that we lay all of our fears and anxieties before you knowing that you are the one that can manage it all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we know that you understand all of the concerns of our hearts. And so we lay those before you now, knowing that you hear everything, whether spoken aloud or not. Lord, we echo the desire of our friends on Zoom who are holding Fred close and offering up lots of well wishes for him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so, Lord, we come together in one voice, praying the prayer that you taught us, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Friends, your charge this week is to just take a deep dive into the covenant of the law, to take a moment to read and reflect it, to consider what it is that God has stated for us is um, the plan for being in relationship, and just see where it takes you. May the God of all creation bless you and keep you. May Jesus Christ make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Holy Spirit lift up her countenance upon you and bring you peace. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.